Welcome to Newbie Art Diary number 434 for the 18th of November 2020. Newbie Art, a different perspective on the African world. Okay, the November promo is Cadence Revolution, Dees Debs International Volume 2, Various Artists, and it's out on the Strut Air Caribs label right now. This is another faultless compilation by the Strut imprint with 15 tracks which accompany an earlier selection from these Debs. The label was based in Guadeloupe with an offshoot in Martinique. However, their links span the Caribbean, the Americas, Europe and Africa. And this is reflected in the breadth of stylistic influences among the artists included here, ranging across merengue, beguin, jazz, reggae, guaca, salsa, calypso, soul, rumba, disco and quadrille. Cadence was an overarching title for music from the French-speaking Caribbean islands. It grew out of Cadence Rampa, a Haitian term pioneered by Weber Seco, who developed Compass Direct while playing with the Haitian saxophonist, songwriter and bandleader Nimrod Jean-Baptiste. Dees Debs International is the longest running and most prolific label of the French Caribbean with over 200 album releases and a further 300 singles. It was set up by the late Henry Debs in the late 50s and played a pivotal role in bringing the Creole music of Guadeloupe and Martinique to a wider international audience. Based in a small but state-of-the-art studio on the first floor of Henry Debs Club 97-1, just outside Pointe Pietra in the town of Gossier, it was a hub for cross-fertilization by artists and musicians who would often sit in on each other's sessions or could be found working in the record shop. The album opens with tracks from the three big local groups led by Super Combos, Juan Domi Dero, Sleep Outdoors, which was inspired by the poverty they saw among their Guadeloupian compatriots while on tour in France. Super Combo's singer was the policeman Henry Rico Lacatin, and he returns later as Rico Epio with Pacola La. Les Vikings Ambion sees their singer Hippomine Lova introducing the band. It is based on the Ivorian Amadie Pierre song and would also form the basis for their 1980s hit Mikolasi. Typical Combo's Pien Salo Bien is a salsa cover of the Lebron Brothers track with a strong cha-cha feel. Guad Africa Combo are a mix of Guadeloupian musicians and members of the Congolese rumba outfit Le Raiko Jazz, who had toured the region in 1967 and set up camp in Martinique. Their track here is Mwansa Rao Rao. Galaxy were a Paris-based outfit whose track, Disco Funk, widened the appreciation of the island music. Combet's Laj Uyo, featuring a young Frederick Caracas on bass, would point the way that Antillian music would take in the 1980s when Zouk took over the firmament. Smoke were a Dominican outfit with members from several bands. Their track here, Lina Femme Fall, was written by their accordionist Remy Mondé, who was a Deb stalwart throughout the 1960s. In the 1970s, Dees Debs would put out an increasing number of full albums, allowing the tracks to be longer so the bands could stretch out. Tracks over five minutes, such as Les Rapaces' Music Passe Partout, would become common. HWT band were led by Henry Wenselas Tenard, who had travelled to France with Les Vikings as part of their horn section and stayed on to lead another band, Laser. Now back in Guadeloupe, he recorded Good Trip for the label. Midnight Groovers were a roots reggae band bringing a Rastafari worldview to the proceedings with their cadence lipso track, Stranger. T. Celeste track, Mon Envoyi Danse, En Belle Begin, I Want to Dance a Begin, is modern guaca with bass and sax added to the percussion. Bien Valence, Abbey Mien, were a folkloric orchestra who updated quadrille and merengue styles for Tijenzo Nu, which translates as Our Youth. Guy Conquet and Song Group's Ping Pong was a hit with the Colombian Pico sound systems, and like Ambience, was covered by Waganda Kenya for the mighty Discos Fuentes label. Edward Benoit 
was a saxophonist and arranger who, along with Super Combo's bassist, Sully R. Sainz, Congero's Serge Christophe, and drummer Christian Fanfan, was the backbone of much of the tracks recorded by Dee Stead. Benno had been the musical director of Les Maxels, but here he offers up Mauve Chauffe under his own name with a mixture of Haitian, Guadeloupian and Puerto Rican influences from this keen Latin jazz exponent. The album closes with the tableau number two, Begin, Experience, featuring Frankie Vincent and some Haitian influenced guitar licks. The package features previously unseen photos from the Debs archive with both formats featuring extensive liner notes and an interview with singer and trombonist Christian Zora, who played in Les Maxwell's and Energy and at one point ran his own record shop. For the November media, we're looking at an article called Critical Reflections on Safety Net Policies and Practices with Respect to Social Protection Among Pastoralist Peoples in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this is written by Bereket Tesegai, and it's part of the SPIDA Working Papers series. Over the last five decades, the frequent natural and man-made disasters across Africa has created major threats to stability. And on page one, Tesegai writes, These challenges have been exacerbated by, among other things, dysfunctional national policies, marginalization from political centers and development processes, a general misunderstanding of pastoralist livelihoods and its contribution to food security, national economies and ecological sustainability, climate shocks and then conflicts and violence. Food is becoming increasingly scarce and community resilience and adaptation to climate change has become a topic of discussions to take seriously. Many of the reports and studies on the issue show that most of the safety net and social protection policy instruments adopted by African countries have a nationwide focus and ignore the specific needs of pastoral livelihood systems. Policies often follow generic approaches and are adopted to address a particular episode, catastrophe, or emergency. They are event triggered and short term and are not fully integrated into intergenerational development agendas. On page 12, we quote, in Eastern Africa, pastoralism provides employment for up to 20 million people and in Kenya's ASAL alone, it accounts for 90% of the employment opportunities and 95% of family income and security. Still, given the prevailing resilience challenges, pastoral systems need to have certain supportive elements in place in order to maintain these livelihoods. What's called the international community have taken an interest in development to seek ways to potentially help those in the most critical need. The nexus of households and community resilience among pastoral groups and the social protection measures being injected into their livelihoods requires critical engagement. A quote on page three, the nexus approach highlights the interdependence between water, energy, and food security in pursuing sustainable resource use and development. It emphasizes the inadequacy of a purely sectoral approach and the need to understand synergies and negotiate fair trade-offs between competing uses and users of resources. And there's what's called the social protection policy designs and patterns. There are three types of social protection based on local ownership and institutionalization in national processes. These were developed by Gentilini and Omamo and cited by Devereux. Consolidated social protection is institutionalized in national domestic budgets and political processes, as well as linked to formal labor markets. It includes both contributory social insurance and non-contributory social assistance, with the main challenge being to maintain and reform these systems and keep them financially sustainable.
Emerging social protection can be found in Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Latin America. There are wide differences in the specific models, but usually international assistance plays a minor role in funding their setup, and most systems are domestically funded. The main focus in these countries lies on expanding social protection, particularly formal contributory social security, and improving the coordination, coverage, effectiveness and efficiency of the programmes. Limited social protection is found in countries where the need for social protection is high, but national fiscal capacity is limited. In some countries, social safety nets are donor-funded, or basic longer-term social protection systems are slowly scaled up, as in Ethiopia. The essay covers protection mechanisms for communities which speak of the indigenous people's own knowledge systems which they use to promote resilience. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change emphasises the implications of resilience to climate change-related risks and the importance of reducing exposure and increasing resilience to the potential adverse impacts of climate change extremes. The rights approach looks at social protection as part of a set of fundamental and constitutional rights of a citizen where access to food, water, shelter and political participation are considered as inseparable rights, thus providing citizens with either in-kind support or cash transfers would be an obligation for governments in order to assist those who are incapable of helping themselves. This implies that national social protection measures first achieve legislative support and then ensure citizens' entitlements. The national development approach views social protection in its broader perspectives and centres its agenda on realising long-term impacts. One aspect of this is a strong shift in the approach from maintaining welfare to the goal of developing human capital. This approach looks at the long-term payoff of investments in communities and especially in children. And that's a quote from page six. Pastoralists own informal social and familial networks. See them helping by restocking families and rebuilding their assets after a severe drought and the loss of livestock. Other social supports include fostering of orphans, support for HIV-affected people with the provision of antiretrovirals and finances. Formal social protection networks are often led by governments, NGOs and international organisations through the provision of food aid, cash, asset building, restocking households with cattle, supplying animal fodder or providing veterinary services. This includes the rights-based social protection floor of the International Labour Organization which started in 2012 and the integrated social protection systems of UNICEF's policy framework. The eco-experts, a British-based research team, developed the DN Game Index which ranks countries by their vulnerability to and readiness to adapt to climate change. Somalia is considered the nation most at risk, followed by Chad, Eritrea, the Central African Republic and Democratic Republic of Congo. And the quote, These are risks associated with a variety of natural and man-made events and shocks, including civil wars, local conflicts, and resource-based conflicts, economic and price shocks, droughts and natural catastrophes, earthquakes or volcanic eruptions like the 2011 Nabru eruption that hit the Eritrean and Ethiopian Afar pastoralists. Recently, countries across the Horn of Africa region, including pastoralists in Ethiopia, Somalia and other countries, were hit by severe and protracted El Nino related droughts, with a high risk of livelihood loss. Recurring high-level risk frequency and intensity associated with extreme climatic conditions have produced situations that exhaust informal coping mechanisms 
and are such that rebuilding livelihoods after disasters at shorter levels may prove impossible. And that's a quote from page 8. One of the biggest environmental threats is the felling of trees, the lungs of the planet, for charcoal. Although often driven by necessity, this is very short term as the land cover is then degraded, creating further economic hardship. In the first instance, people can try to cope by changing their diets or reducing the number of meals they have daily. But as the food insecurity worsens, they are forced into selling their livestock, farm tools or other belongings. Another challenge to pastoralists is that central government policies often favour agricultural expansion or large-scale industrialization policies, often through military intervention. This pushes pastoralists further into poverty and to adopt steal and loot activities, which are often met with further oppression. The examples of the Tuaregs in Mali, Ethiopia's famine in the 1980s, the Horn of Africa's 2008 food security and drought crisis, Madagascar's flood in 2000, and the economic shocks and increased food prices of 2008-9 are at the forefront of people's minds. Across Africa, most nation-state governments have a narrow fiscal base due to limited revenue generation and chronic poverty among huge swathes of the population. They are often not in a position to collect money in a logistically coherent way and this is further hampered by levels of corruption. This means in general states lack the capacity to fund safety nets, leaving their citizens at the mercy of external donors. But this over-reliance on donors has consequences for governance as agencies may choose to bypass government structures or being able to draw on international funding, some NGOs may be richer or more powerful than struggling nation-state governments. There are hopes that the adoption of technology can help address some of these challenges. Pastoralists can send and receive money transfers on phones in several countries in the absence of formal banking systems. They can also use the internet to check up on weather conditions, grazing and water spots, and the prices for livestock and other products. This article was written by Bereket Tesegai, who is the Interim Director and Senior Researcher at PENA. And you can contact him at b.tesegai, that's T-S-E-G-A-Y, at penanetwork.org. That's b T S E G A Y at P E N H A N E T W O R K dot org. And it was published by the Social Protection for Inclusive Development in Afra, Ethiopia, which is a consortium of the Development Planning Unit, University College London, Adigra University of Ethiopia and the Pastoral and Environmental Network in the Horn of Africa. Okay, so let's move on to lyrics and spirits. O ye gods of the underworld, who set yourself up against me, and who resist the mighty ones, the stars which never set have led me on my way. And that's from chapter 78 of the Papyrus of Annie. And the poem is called Strange Ways of Love. HMP Strangeways was the main Manchester prison before it was renamed. This poem was written in the aftermath of an uprising by inmates there against the inhumane conditions and prison officer brutality. So this one's strange ways of love. This is a crime, I must confess. I've opened my heart and I got a rest. And the one girl I love, not the rest. She's the one who passed the test. So girl, you have to love me true. Let me know what I can do for you. Witness what you do for me and come on down to the rescue. Now go sell block for this love. Now go dovecot, live in love. In solitary confinement so long, respect, remand, romance, freedom. Guilty as judged by old jury, conviction all over me from head to toe. 
sentence was surely a relief because to lock down in love, that was my brief. The screw is the prison warder. Them serve up the governor. I come tell them love is the power, but all they want is to follow rumour. And now I go sell block for this love. Now I go dove caught, live in love. In solitary confinement so long, respect, remand, romance, release. And that was written back in May 1990, and it was published in Off Slaughter and Consumption. And I've got to say big thanks to Gregory Isaac, Sugar Miner, and Johnny P for the inspiration. Okay, so we've come to the end of this edition of the Newbie Art Diary. If you want to get in touch with me, it's Kobara Zamani, African Quest, PO Box 35165, London SE5. AWU, the email AfricanQuest1 at hotmail.com, and Twitter NubiArt Diary. And we'll just finish with our saying, Talk sense, but it don't make sense you talk. Thanks for listening. Guidance. <laughs>